Yo! Video games. What up, dudes? Matt here with Yo! Video Games and another review. This one a bit more timely, or try to be timely, and it's all about what is in very likelihood going to be my favorite game of the year, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Now, to cover all the bases and cross all the T's and dot the I's, let's briefly explain what Rebirth is and get some things out of the way. This will be a half spoiler free review and a half spoiler review. What that means is everything I can possibly cover without going into any spoilers, I will do first. No worries, I will be giving out my score before going into spoiler territory. This is a big game with a lot going on and I think it's fair that some people might want to know as much as they can before dropping 70 or $100 without getting any of it ruined for them story-wise. So with that out of the way, let's quickly break down what Rebirth is. Rebirth is the second part of a trilogy of games that aims to retell the story of Final Fantasy VII with, as of today's, modern day graphics and gameplay. There is a recap video at the title screen if you're jumping in now or just need a refresher. That being said, while much of the gameplay of the previous title in regards to combat is very similar you know, to the previous game, the major selling point of this entry is how much has been expanded. So with that, let's get right into the gameplay loop of Rebirth. When Square Enix confirmed more than half a decade ago that the first part of the Final Fantasy VII trilogy would only be covering Midgar, my heart sank in real time. I knew this meant we would be getting a heavily cinematic game devoid of exploration and discovery and all my personal favorite parts of the original game's release, and boy fucking howdy was I right about that. While I stand by that remake was a good game overall, it was absolutely a linear corridor walking simulator that was saved by its stellar localization, character moments, and the cool new battle system. The actual gameplay loop, if you could even call it that, in remake sucked a fat dick most of the time. Outside of Wall Market, what meager few side quests that did exist were some bottom of the barrel fetch quests. Find your neighbor's lost cats. Literally. While the rest of the game asked of your ability to run down a hallway to enable the next cutscene. Rebirth throws a lot of this design out the window. Hell, they even make a story and thematic element to an extent. Having finally left the metropolitan hellscape that Square seems so bizarrely fond of, we have finally once again returned to the wider open world of Final Fantasy VII, and they've done it in style. A lot of this is thanks to Naoki Hamaguchi taking the helm as main director of the title and his love of open and large zone RPGs. Hamaguchi's fondness for titles such as The Witcher 3 and Horizon shine through very rapidly in this title and to good effect. Harvesting plants and minerals to synthesize items and multi-tiered side quests that layer on top of each other throughout the course of the game are some of the most immediately noticeable gameplay elements. Rebirth takes a n place in a number of different large biomes. Each has a similar number of things to do, and finding their locations can be pinpointed by the use of a Ubisoft-style towers in each area. While this may sound daunting, the actual number of things to do is typically far, far less than your usual Assassin's Creed affair. And frankly, just when I was getting a bit toasted by them, I had reached the last one. Suffice to say, Rebirth doesn't wear out its welcome of optional overworld things to do and ends just when it's getting a bit old. These things to do involve finding hidden springs, rare fiend fights, and activating shrines to fight summons, as well as quest lines and unique minigames. Speaking of, a big selling point of Rebirth is the sheer amount of them. This is no joke. Every single area of the game features at least a few unique minigames totally exclusive to that area. Most of them are a pretty good time. A couple of them are duds, but they are all offer something extra to earn beyond just completing side quests. I don't want to go too in-depth into this since the discovery is half the fun of these, so yeah, like I'll let you figure out what they are, what the minigames entail. Longtime Final Fantasy nut-huggers will remember when having a card game was a big deal in 8 and 9, and now, finally, 7 embraces it with its own unique card game called Queen's Blood that is introduced very early on and goes all the way to endgame in the background. I'm not going to talk your ear off on specifics, but the game is addicting and frustrating to lose. I hate it, but I always want a salty run back every time I play it and lose, so therefore, it's pretty great. There is, of course, plenty of minigames at the Gold Saucer, however, not really as many as you might expect. It doesn't really go far beyond what was on offer in the original game, and in fact is missing basketball. R.I.P. to that. 
What it does keep, though, is highly expanded, especially the Chocobo Racing, which is basically a whole ass game's worth of content unto itself. Boiling it all down, there's a large variety of things to do, and even when something doesn't quite hit minigame-wise, it's nice to know you won't really have to play it that much. All that being said, it's time to talk about the battle system. I will try and make it brief. Try. The basic gist of the real-time combat is the same as Remake. The biggest addition is synergy skills and abilities. These are unlocked in a new Folio system. Folio is just their name for Sphere Grid. It looks and functions exactly the same. Synergy skills are moves you unlock between two sets of characters that you can do without using ATB meter. These can come in very clutch and, they're a, and they fix a huge problem in Remake where you could be out of meter and having to block and just stand and wait around. Perfect Guard is also here and glorious, however one thing I don't really like is that you can't perfect block out of an attack animation, so you need to be at the end of a combo string or in neutral to really nail it every time. Synergy abilities are basically new types of limit breaks between characters and they have a separate meter represented by pit bars that fill up before you can do them. Synergy abilities can be super broken, like do things like extending or increasing the stagger time or percentage. The magic system with materia essentially functions the same way, only thing of note is that you can craft accessories now as well, which is actually kind of awesome as it cuts out having to go back to a town or shop just to, you know, buy a new accessory or ban, and it can save you money in general. Having a sphere grid is awesome as well, and the new characters are unique and mostly fun. Kate Sith is debatable on that. But here, it is here in the battle system, is the one thing in this entire game that knocks it down a bit on the point scale. There are no settings in the game to set AI commands for your party members. You can't tell them to focus on a single enemy or spread out. You can't tell them to be aggressive or defensive. The only way to get them to do what you want is through materia slots. This is baffling to me and requires you to babysit your party by hot swapping between them way more than you should have to. I'm not even asking for a whole ass gambit system here. However, one of the minigames actually uses the gambit system, so it's not like they couldn't implement it somehow. But if you want someone in your party to heal you, you will need to put their heal materia in a linked materia slot and then use up the other side with an auto cast materia just to get them to do this basic function. Same for auto ability materia if you want them to use prey on hard mode or just any other ability. The problem here is that to cast materias, you need ATB meter, and the AI is criminally slow at filling their ATB meter. Seeing them slow circle enemies and not doing a goddamn thing was a constant annoyance throughout the duration of the entire game. This can also be slightly lessened by, guess what, using up another materia slot by giving them a first strike materia as well, so they enter each new battle with a slightly filled up ATB bar. All of this could have been extremely easily avoided and let you keep open materia slots if they even had some of the most basic AI settings. Now, this doesn't ruin the game. It doesn't make battles more, you know, it makes, makes some battles a little more frustrating and the game smartly, though, lets you freely exchange materia between characters, even when you're temporarily out of the party, except on the final boss for some bizarre ass reason. But there is one other slight annoyance to this as well. The game likes to lock you into party setups almost a little too much. Again, it's not much of a problem since it lets you freely exchange materia, but there's no, there are no saving materia loadouts in this game. That is something the original game actually had. Again, truly baffling, and while we're on it, the Kate Sith solo section sucks the biggest dick in the whole game. Now, like I said, these don't ruin the game, they don't suck all the fun out or anything, but they are strange decisions that could and should have easily been fixed. Other than that, there's a few weird scenarios where you're locked into one character and you can't, re and you, when that happens, you could really see how undesigned the game is for solo fights. And the game relies way too much on the VR simulator to earn unique materia, pad out side quests, or even fight summons. It's the JRPG equivalent of the grid in fighting games, and I'm a little bummed so much of the damn game falls back to throwing you in the same developer build ass looking arena to earn cool shit. Now let's talk about graphics. Character models are 10 out of 10. No notes, moving on. When the remake project first started, they at the time decided to go with Unreal 4 for Midgar, which was a smart move as the Luminous engine was a disaster. However, for Rebirth, this kind of turned into a bit of a headache, as Unreal 4 is built in a way that is really not good for open world, which is the main selling point of this game. Oops. 
The fact that it works as well as it does is a huge testament to the skill and care put into the game from the developers. At the same time, there's only so much they could do, even with the exclusive power of the illustrious PlayStation 5 or whatever. The art style is top-notch as always, and the map design is almost Xenoblade good. However, on a purely technical level, this doesn't look anywhere near as good as, say, Horizon 2, or hell, even Ghost of Tsushima. The Unreal 4 isms like to rear their head at every opportunity, and nowhere is this more apparent than the lighting. When the game is inside a controlled environment, the lighting looks amazing, which is roughly 30% of the game. And then 35% of the time, it looks fine, if a little flat. The remaining 35%, the lighting in the game is shit. Walking from indoors to out is always flashbangs you, and going inside basically turns the screen pitch black. The time for it to adjust is always harsh and noticeable. Maybe this is something that could get patched? I'm hoping it is. Other than that, you have foliage that doesn't move at all, and lots of little unreal texture quirks such as rock surfaces that just suddenly go from great to crap a lot. To reiterate, the art style and level design and character models are top of the line, and the other issues rarely are much of any real distraction at all. Just, if you were hoping for a PlayStation 5 exclusive to showcase the system capabilities, you won't get that here. Musically, the game features a lot of tracks from Remake, but literally hundreds more for this game. This game is an audio feast. The biggest of love letters to the original score. Not only do you get battle variations of many songs, you will get unique song variations that exist, exist solely for one cutscene or one minigame. It's exquisite, and thank fucking God almighty, the game has overworld music going all the time. No ambient bullshit here. The only thing disappointing is that since there is no day to night cycle in the game, we don't get nighttime variations of overworld themes. Oh well. The new music is fantastic as well, though clearly more in the style of the other composers, which of I, I counted at least 12 in the credits. The new vocal song by Uematsu is fantastic and way better than Remake's vocal song, personal opinion obviously, but I liked it, and its implementation a hell of a lot more here. This soundtrack is one for the books, and for good reason. So since we've gotten through all of that, this is the spoiler-free ends here, and I'm just going to say right now, this is a 9.5. That's my score for this game, 9.5. Uh, personally, maybe it could fluctuate a little bit, but that would be dependent on how you feel about the spoilers, which I have not talked about yet and which I am going to. So if you were watching this video and you wanted to know what the score is, you wanted to know the breakdown of the gameplay, it's a 9.5. I think it's going to be my game of the year. I think it's great. All that being said, let's go into spoiler mode, which is going to be about the story, the characters, the world building, the villains, and the plot. So... Spoiler mode start. The characters are great in this game as they were in the first game. Again, I have to really emphasize how good the localization team did at this game. Because like, not only is stuff lip synced to English if you want to play in English, but it's just the fact that they really went out of their way to make the, the dialogue sound supernatural and not like a, like a machine translation. It's very well done. Uh, the characters are all kind of unique. And what's nice here is that they, I feel like they stand out a little more. Barrett is the true heart and soul of this game. Um, Cloud, as the unreliable narrator, kind of like devolves further and further as the game goes along. He almost has like a, a character in decline, if you will, which is actually correct in, in what it should be. Um, Aerith is really kind of the more interesting one because it definitely feels like she's on to more than she lets on, but like... There's a sort of fear there. Tifa definitely is is kind of one of those you really feel for this character, and she actually gets more stuff in this game for for character moments than were even in the original game, such as her little uh, swim into the live stream on the inside of a weapon, which is really random. Red Thirteen is great. I do, however, have to say his voice is interesting because in the first half of the game he has the big wise man voice, and then in the second half of the game he has this little teenage kid boy voice. Now this is actually in line for what uh, Nanaki was supposed to sound like in the original game, where he was putting on a fake voice for you know, for the the team, and they talk about it in this game too. However, it's just holy Jesus God, like it, it, his his. His, his teenage boy voice is so much worse than his wizened old man voice, and I wish he would have just kept the charade up because, man, do not do not like do not like young sounding Nanaki at all. Yuffie also drives me up a wall, but however, it's it's fairly accurate to what the character is. She's a hyperactive sixteen year old, so her being a hyperactive sixteen year old that's exhausting to listen to is fairly on point. Kate Sith is great, you know, as as. 
as usual, Reeves running around with his, you know, his faux Irish accent or whatever. Um, but yeah, it, it all it all really works there. Um, as far as like you know, is is it this game is much more anime as fuck than say Final Fantasy sixteen, which tried its damnedest to be you know Game of Thrones, you know gruff and tumble, you know characters' voices sound like they they came through a crackling fireplace. Um, but yeah, this game is, is full of animeisms. Like, yeah, the anime grunting is back and whatever. And if you pay attention, no single female character model in this game, uh, acts or moves like a real human being. They all do the constant J idol posing. Like they, there is every single character. It's, it, it's, it, let me ruin anime and games for you because every game knows this is not unique to Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. This is every, every fucking anime and, and game is that like if you notice it's, this is what Miyazaki talks about what drives him nuts is that how characters always are like doing these weird like pigeon toed feet things or these weird things with their arms or the way they run it's very bizarre but you know if 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 anime grunts and, and anime you know j-pop isms sort of drive you nuts I don't know maybe this game is not for you it's it's not a big deal for me because again these are anime as fuck characters they always have been um one thing I do want to talk about, though, that I, is a huge positive here is that by going into the open world of the game, they've actually had an opportunity to expand the world building of the world of Final Fantasy VII. And it's so good here because it wasn't just like how Shinra is a piece of shit everywhere in the world. I mean, you get that. But they added all kinds of lore and, and, and world building stuff to the game. Like the Republic of Junon is so insanely expanded, like which really didn't exist in the original game at all. And now they have this huge backstory and history of the Republic of Junon and how it was formed and how it, you know, basically eventually fell to Shindra in a war. Uh, so it's it's really just it's it's really good stuff here. Um, I can't say enough good stuff about like the world building and stuff there. What I can say uh, that probably won't be as popular, obviously, is that the villains in this game are the villains of Final Fantasy VII, and I feel the same about them as I always have, which is they're not great. They're either Captain Planet villains, which is fine, or they're just these weird thirst trap characters. Like they're they're not compelling. I don't buy any of their I don't buy any of their their stories or or motivations whatsoever. They all exist to either get people thirsty or just get people angry. You know. I guess going into it a little bit more, I don't buy Sephiroth's motivation at all. You know, his his backstory has never really been enough for me to be like, oh, what a great villain. I'm like, okay, you're you're a super soldier created in a test tube by you know splicing alien DNA into your own. Okay, I guess I'll go burn a village now. Learning that info. Okay, Sephiroth, you do you, I guess. But again, like Hojo, Heidegger, Palmer, Scarlet. They're just Captain Planet villains. The Turks are just like, I'm mysterious and cool. Ooh, like Roof, uh, Rude gets actually something really fun in this game. So they do try to make a little more going on. But like there was never a moment where I didn't want to you know, punch a hole through Elena's head through the whole game. Um, Rufus exists strictly to be like, oh, I'm a tortured soul bad boy. And then he gets he keeps getting visited by a character who you have no idea of unless you played some mobile game. I don't like these villains. I think Final Fantasy VII is a game with a, an amazing cast of characters uh, with a really cool, you know, backstory world they're in. They're in search of, they're just in search of such better villains. These, The villains in this game tend to, to me, are just more or less just, they are doing things to do things their de- like their motivations are paper thin and it's fine to have like just you know, a silly wild crazy you know your Heidegger's Palmer Scarlet's it's fine to have villains like that that's your Hojo's these are you know that's fine if you just want to have like just wacky you know over the top villains but then you tr- it's the more that the game tries to sell you on the idea that like no no we've got these really intricate convoluted villains like Rufus and Shinra are really tortured so no they're not Um, And all that being said, I'm dancing around the subject here, and that is the plot. And that is, I do like the plot of this game up until the end. I don't agree with the ending. Um, The ending, they go for a huge curveball where they take the most iconic moment of the original game, and they basically try to throw, like, a new curveball at you. And they, what this ends up doing in this spoiler mode is that you don't get the full, the full cutscene of Aerith getting killed. You don't get Cloud's speech, and you don't even have any... You get, like, little chopped-up bits of it in the sort of, like, highly edited, cut-up, you know, static imagery shit in Cloud's head. And you don't get the burial scene at all. There is no burial scene. 
And this is seemingly because Cloud is just on a different plane of existence where like he basically is he is hallucinating or possibly being manipulated by Genova to be seeing to be seeing Aerith as alive and that he succeeded in saving her, but he really didn't, where everyone else is is really saddened by it. So they go for this really weird curveball ending that Cloud is a, the unreliable narrator. He's so unreliable now that he thinks he changed fate and he saved Aerith, and so therefore the one big most important moment of the game is not in this game and is just left out possibly so they can just do some weird flashback like no cloud she really died you didn't save her so they could do this bullshit in part three and i don't like it i don't agree with it i did not want to see the the weird time traveling not or or, or multi-dimensional multi-timeline uh time skipping stuff i didn't want to see that infused in the most important part of the original game i wanted just to see the original part played out as you know as heartbreaking and dramatically as possible and not do this did it did he save her did he not save her did he is he gonna save her is he just is he just going crazy is he you know is he just like suppressing his feelings da, 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 da. like we don't really know we're not going to show it so so we can maybe show the most important plot point of the original game as a flashback somewhere later in the last third i do not agree with this I don't. I don't like the decision that was done here. Yes, it's 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 definitely a gutsy call, but I think it's a. It, I don't think it works. It just left me feeling. Why are we doing this? I don't like. I I should be feeling sad as hell at the ending. I should be crushed. I should be emotionally devastated. But instead, I'm just like, why are we doing this? So not. It was not a good feeling. Like to to end the game on like the. You know, the last cutscene's great in the, in the credits, you know, roll on beautiful song and music and all that jazz. But, like, to me, it was it was a game that was sprinting, you know, it was sprinting a gold medal winning run in the Olympics. And then it got right to the end and it tripped. It tripped a little bit right at the end. It didn't really, it didn't fail the game again. It, you know, it, it fell on its face a bit, but it still crossed the finish line. It's still a great game. But, yeah, I'm not, I'm not in... I'm not in agreement or, or I'm not really super happy with, with how they handled the most important plot element of the original game here. But I think the fact of the matter is you still have a hundred hour game behind it that was a blast to play start to finish. A great battle system, great characters, great world building, um, you know, tons of mini games, an insane amount of like variety of things to do. A lot of little tiny little issues. But otherwise, just, you know, uh, just absolute, you know, top of the line, you know, uh, audio feast and, and, and gameplay feast. I just love so much about this game that, like, it's it's more of, of a little bit like, well, I'm a little bummed they went this way with the ending. I'm, but it doesn't change the fact that, is this a $70 game? Yeah. Does it feel worth it? Yeah. Do I feel like, it, you know, you, you know, anyone should go ahead and play? Yes, I do. This is a great game. It's probably the best game Square Enix has released in decades, I could probably easily say at least decades. Like, uh, like as a, as a critical game, yeah, like it's it's definitely up there. It's not the best. Again, I don't think it's the best story or plot. The villains are weak. The plot is is just. It feels like they're just throwing curveballs and twists just to pile convolution on something that really didn't need it. I'm I am actually un. I'm still unmoved by the the rationale behind. Uh, trying to have multiple timelines, throwing that wrench in there to make it more of a sequel than an actual remake. I'm still not on board. I don't think they've convinced me that that was a worthwhile endeavor because at the end of the day, it's like, oh, all this crazy stuff is happening. Is it actually improving the plot of the original game? Not at all. Like, I'm I'm still completely unconvinced that this was, this was worth doing to the plot at all. It could have just been played straight, and I don't know that I would have cared. Like, if they, if they expand, just expanded you know, and, and, and enhanced the original story rather than tried to make this, this weird multidimensional stuff, I probably would have been happier right now. I'm, I'm not convinced this was... I'm still unconvinced by the whispers and, and the defying fate. I'm still unconvinced that this is a worthy plot line at all yet. I'm, I'm unconvinced. Maybe 3 will do that for me. That's that's the big thing three's, Part 3 is going to have to do for me. But Part 2 was such a course correction. Like I, like, like I said, like this is a... F Full point higher than the original game remake was a quality game but it was 
severely held back by its by its scope, which it had none. This game is all scope, and and it's and it leaves your mouth feeling refreshed uh, at the end of it. So I I love this game. I love this game. You know, small nitpicks aside, loved it. Go buy it. Go play it. That's what I gotta say. Again, nine point five. Maybe personally more of a closer to a nine. If, if I'm really taking into account how I feel about the story, because I really don't agree with the direction it's heading. I, it feels convolution for convolution's sake. But I mean, it, it's still, that's a very personal thing. That's going to be up to you to decide whether or not you believe that or not. But as for me, I think it's a great game, game of the year. I would say go check it out. Uh, if you're brand new to Final Fantasy VII, good luck, because this game really doesn't care if, if you're new to the series, this is this is for old timey fans. So keep that in mind. But for people who did play the original game, it, this is pretty great. Pretty great. It, it's 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 a wonderful, wonderful uh, re you know realization of, of seeing that world brought to life in a much bigger way. So go check it out and let me know what you guys think. And I will see you on the channel later, dudes.